All right, we are going to start our uh, next practicum for spring 2020, computational archaeology. And today what we're going to cover is thematic mapping and cartography in QGIS 3.4. So uh, what we really want to do is firstly uh, style the map using the techniques we talked about in class the other day thematically. Uh, and particularly what we want to do instead of uh, qualitatively styling, which is what we've sort of been doing by setting our, the colors of our lines uh, interactively, we want to style our map quantitatively. So we basically want to take numbers that are in the table associated with our vector data uh, or even our raster data for that matter and use those numbers according to some logical, uh, uh, I guess, coloring rules to, to essentially use color and or shape to express uh, the actual pattern of the numbers in, in the files, but do that spatially on the map. Uh, and again, that's the kind of whole point of uh, thematic mapping, quantitative thematic mapping, is to use color and shape to show the patterns in the data rather than you having to go and look at a bunch of numbers, okay? So I'm in QGIS right now, uh, basically exactly where I left off on the last uh, practicum. And uh, I'm going to show you how to uh, get going with a couple of different uh, thematic mapping approaches. First thing I want to do is uh, bring back in the SRTM elevation file. If I zoom out, again, I'm just using my mouse wheel to scroll back. Uh, remember last time I had forgotten how to actually make the um, make the ocean go clear or transparent in QGIS. And uh, I just wanted to start with there because that is actually a kind of thematic mapping for rasters. We already sort of did a little bit by setting the color scale here. Uh, but let's just get back into our um, SRTM properties. You can right click and go to properties or you can actually just double click on that. And if you remember from before, you know this is where this is basically where we got. We went from uh, single band gray, we turned it to single band pseudo color, and we went and we found our preferred color ramp. In this case, I chose the Viridis one. I could have chosen any one of these uh, color ramps over here. And I got to this point uh, by classifying it, and then I couldn't figure out how to make zero, uh, you know, I changed the minimum to zero, how to, how to make that clear, right? Uh, so what you do, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can go in and double click on any one of these little color dots and you get your color chooser and you can simply make the opacity down to zero. Now by default if we just do that and hit apply you'll see that actually there's a band where it's fading from transparent to the next one and that's because we have the interpolation between zero and 61 to be linear meaning that it's going to fade between the color of zero and the color we've chosen for 61. So to make that be uh, uh, sort of more precise, we can choose discrete. When we apply that, we basically get a solid band there. I believe we can also hit exact. Uh, no, actually, sorry. we have to hit discrete, and we get uh, you know this this line of the coast to be very very solid indeed. Okay, so that's just a little sort of quick intro to uh, thematic mapping with um, with raster files. But uh, the sort of main focus of our assignment today is really going to be thematic mapping with, uh, with vector files. So we have this behind. Uh, we can either choose to, to highlight that if we want the topography to show through, or we can make it go away. We're going to make it just sort of go away for now. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is to zoom in onto let's our uh, survey square that we found, so more or less zoom in like so. And you'd be doing styling the structures that you digitized and or the ones from 2017. I'm just going to show you the 2017 structure outlines because there's a lot of diversity of uh, types and conditions in there. And I'll show you uh, secondly how you can do it with your one. So we'll start with 2017s. Again, we can right click and go to properties or we can just double click. And by default, we've been dealing uh, with all the lines, all the different types of um, structures in there as one type, one kind of line, and we change the color and we change the thickness and we change the opacity of them with these sort of global sliders here. 
Now, if we want to do thematic mapping, what we have to do is to go up here where it says single symbol, click on it, and we can choose a couple of different things, categorized or graduated. And both of these two, categorized and graduated, are, are ways of quantitative thematic mapping. So let's start with um, categorized first. And you'll see it's, uh, when you click that, you get it all blanked out. First thing you have to do is to pick a column from the data, data table. And this is the column that's going to contain the information that, you, that you're going to use to, uh, to style the map based on what data is actually in there. And when we choose categorize, you're basically going to get all the columns of data, whether they have strings of text in them or whether they have numbers. Okay? Because what you're going to do is to make a certain number of categories and then you're give, going to give them colors or stuff like that all right, to basically portray those things. So what we'll do here is, just for, uh, to make it simple, we'll go to original U, which is the original use or type of structure. And what we'll want to do is to now uh, just hit classify. And essentially what we're doing here is it's going to go look in that column in the data table and find all the different values that exist there. So if I, uh, I'm just going to click OK for now and we'll come back to the colors here in a second, but if I go back here and I right click and I show open attribute table and I go over to the column that says original U, that's this guy here, you can see all of these different kinds of structures in there. And these are actually in the project one file and sort of explanations of what these mean. T wall meaning terrace wall or terrace is an actual terrace or a shed or a rock fence or a paved road or a pigsty, you know, these are all the codes, right? And so what it's doing is just figuring out how many different kinds of structures there are and creating that number of categories and then giving us essentially stylistic attributes for each one here. Uh, so by default it's set to be random colors and you may want it to be random colors or you may want to go in there and pick a special sort of color ramp if you want. Uh, for example, we can pick this magma color ramp and hit classify and hit apply and we see all the colors in the background changed again. Uh, in that case, what we've done is pick this sort of continuous ramp of colors and so if these data were ordered, if the alphabetic, uh, alphabet uh, if the alphabetic order actually mattered, then we could actually see a pattern, you know, on the map changing from the sort of dark through the purples, reds, uh, oranges, and yellows. But in our case, it doesn't really matter. There's no actual order to these. So probably uh, it would have been better to have picked a uh, just a random color ramp. And we can classify those again. And we can hit apply. And there we go. Our colors are back to random. And that's good enough, right, for what we want uh, for this particular um, particular purpose that we have in mind for these kinds of, of data. Uh, and if we want, we can click the symbol change, and we can actually now go to line, simple line, and we got basically all of the things that we had before, except for the color is not going to stick here. We can actually change how wide the lines are, so I can change these to three, and we can change the actual style to be solid again, um, and we can click OK and apply, and we can see a little bit easier to see now, right? So that's how you get back in and change the thickness, or whether it's dashed or whatever um, as well, like so. Um, now, usually you would be able to see the colors here, but for some reason in my version of 3.4, the colors don't uh, don't show up here, but they will show up in the the legend that we make eventually when we get to the second part of this of this video. So in this case, we can click OK, and we're pretty happy with this, right? So this actually looks pretty good. We can zoom in, and of course, we would have here uh, the legend just in our uh, layer manager. I just hit this little arrow next to it, and there the colors actually show up. So we can actually see what's what. That's pretty cool. Um, and if we wanted to, we can go in individually here and we can edit these colors. So if I didn't like the aqueducts being this brown, I could go in and change them to some sort of green. 
And you have to be a little bit careful here because maybe there is already another green that you're getting close. So what I would say is that when you do this, just be careful that your color scheme continues to make sense. So in this case, if I click OK, the aqueducts are now all green. And the only other thing that's green is a fountain. And that might be all right. Maybe what we want to do is to actually go in to anything that's related to water and actually choose a specific blue color. So we can go in and change all the fountains to be the same blue color over and over and over again. We could change irrigation canals to be the same blue color. Um, all the aqueducts, the irrigation canals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'd have to go through and do this sort of systematically. And then all of a sudden we would get a sort of simpler color palette so that all water features are blue and you know everything else can be, you'd have to choose individual colors for that. So you can kind of have a little bit more direct interactive control over your quantitative categories um, uh, as well by doing that. So that's uh, one way of doing it. If instead we wanted, for example, the symbol sizes to change, in this case since they're all lines, they would be the thicknesses of the lines to change. We can do that too. And we'd have to pick, in this case, instead of categorize, we'd want to pick graduated. And we'd have to pick a numeric column. That's the sort of catch for, for doing it with graduate. It has to be a numeric column. So in our case, I'll pick uh, something like um, width of the feature. That seems to be mapping. Now in your data, the one that you digitized, you'd probably pick condition would be one. Uh, it, because that's the only one that you recorded with a number, right? And here we hit classify, equal interval, and uh, sort of the, by default it says five classes, so we can just see what that looks like. And so we have five thicknesses, and here it also gave us a color ramp, so we have, uh, oh sorry, I, the method by default is color, so it's sort of a color ramp of thinner is white and thicker is red, so we can do it by color as well. And I can change the classes. Maybe I only want like three of them. And I can uh, classif hit classify again. Classify. I hit apply. And now I only have three categories here, right? Uh, if I don't want it to be color, if I said I want it to be size, we would do that. Uh, I always like to hit classify whether or not, whether it's important or not. And now we actually have thicknesses of the line, and they sort of go uh, a little bit too narrow so that you can't even really see, but we'll deal with that here in just a second. Uh, so let's increase our number of categories to like eight and hit classify and apply. And now we can actually see that there's actually some you know, thinner and thicker ones. Now if you want the range to be wider, that's what this size is, size from 0.1 to 2. So it's 0.1 millimeters because we've got millimeters selected here to two millimeters. So if we want the maximum one to be a lot thicker, we could like say for example four millimeters and there we have the thicker one, the thickest possible to be much thicker. And point one is a little too small for us, we can change that to like point five and we hit apply. We can actually start to see some of the small ones. Now we don't have to choose millimeter, we could choose points which are like a similar kinds of pixels but for printing purposes. Or we could actually choose map units, which are, I believe, either meters or kilometers in this. And oh, wait, four is way too much, so we need to put like 0.1 and like 0.01 perhaps, because it must be set to, oh, it's probably set to degrees. So that's probably not going to work in this latitude, longitude uh, system. So probably your best bet is millimeters or pixels, and we can leave it to something like four and for my purposes here 0.5 and I have again eight categories set up here and I can tune those any way I want and now I have the symbol showing up as well and so now I only have four categories and I can actually change the way this the categories are broken apart it's going to just do it in this case equal intervals so each category is going to contain the same amount from point you know, same number of thicknesses, I guess, thickness units. Um, you can play around with some of these other ones, including standard deviations, natural breaks, which uh, sometimes actually works a little bit nicer, sometimes it doesn't. Um, quantiles, including equal counts, 
um, which sometimes also look good, sometimes they don't. Uh, and pretty breaks, you can choose those as well. Um, and of course, you have to change some of this stuff as well to get the everything back. And maybe that looks better with these sort of even categories. So just play around with some of these things and see which ones look look nicer to you. And you'll get a sense of the logic as you do that. And again, in the ones that you digitized, uh, you only have um, two uh, columns. So uh, you can choose those uh, numeric ones for graduated color or graduated um, you know, simple size for condition, and if you go to categorize, you can choose all of the different uh, columns, type or condition, and you can basically do it that way as well. Now, mine's not going to be particularly interesting because I only digitized two structures, but hopefully by the time you're getting to this, you'll have digitized um, many more than two structures, and you can basically make a map. And the choice of colors and the choice of symbol sizes, again, is your uh, purview as the as the mapper and you can choose any color sets or any sizes to emphasize the story that you want to tell but the point is that you're using the actual numbers or the actual data in the table to tell the story according to the rules that you set up so you're not lying to the public by em emphasizing things that sh shouldn't have been emphasized or overemphasizing or underemphasizing things you are just setting up rules to allow the actual natural patterns that are in the data to sort of shine. And that should always be in the back of your head as you do this. You don't want to obfuscate uh, or purposefully falsify the importance of some type data types over others while you're doing this. So once you're happy with the styles that you have, it's time to actually make a final product, a cartographic product, an actual map that you could potentially print off or create a figure for a paper or a poster or for a website or something like that. And to do that, uh, we are going to use the uh, uh, Print Composer. Now they've changed the name in 3.4 to Layout Manager. It used to be called the Print Composer. Uh, and you get to there through the Project menu. Um, you can uh, either go to the Layout Manager and you can create a new layout this way. Or a sort of simple shortcut is Project New Print Layout and just give it a title. And you should give it a unique title because you can have for the same QGIS project and the same set of data you can have as many different actual maps, printable maps uh, that, as you want and you can keep them edited sort of independently of each other. So think of these as a linked but separate kind of project, right? And so you give it a, a name that makes sense to you. Thematic Map Structures widths. Okay, so that's sort of what I'm just going to call this one because that's the data that I have here. You click OK and then open up your, uh, uh, I keep wanting to call it the print composer, but the layout uh, interface here. And the layout interface is essentially the piece of paper, you know, whether it's actually ever going to be printed or not, that you're going to make your map, your finalized cartographic product, your, your, your actual map on. And by default it gives you this uh, landscape A4 uh, orientation. And for your purposes, landscape orientation might be, might be useful to have, if you have your data wider than it is tall. If you have a data that's taller or a map that's taller than wide, then you might want to change that. So you right click anywhere back here and go to page properties. And right over here you get uh, page size. And because we're in the United States, A4 is, is the European metric uh, paper sizes. Let's just pick letter. So whether you want to keep it landscape or portrait, you should pick letter. And then if you want it to be portrait, you can pick, pick portrait. You can basically see how you've just changed the orientation of that. So I'm going to keep mine in landscape for the time being, but it's up to you again to choose the size. And if you wanted to, you can also go down and pick uh, custom, and then here, you can put in anything you want, and you can pick the units, inches, centimeters, picks, pica, whatever it is, and you can change the size to be very, very specific, you know, the dimensions very specifically. 
if you're going to print, you might as well pick the size of paper you're going to print out, letter, legal, uh, any of these other sizes, depending on what you're going to print onto. So, uh, you know, let's just choose letter for now and make our lives a little bit easier. And so now what we have to do is to add content to our blank sheet of paper. And there are multiple ways to do that, but uh, a simple uh, set of tools for that exist over here for adding different kinds of content. And we have uh, essentially ways to add maps, 3D uh, maps, pictures, text, legends, scale bars, shapes, arrows, uh, node item, which is basically like drawing a line shape, um, or tables and uh, uh, HTML, and all kinds of stuff that we can add simply here. And then up here we have a bunch of like navigation tools. And we have up here like saving, printing, turning into PDFs and that kind of stuff. And we have some really neat aligning and distributing to basically make sure all our items are going to line up and our zoom and all of this kind of stuff. So a lot of these work the same way they work in the regular map display, the panning and the view. But a few of them are slightly different because this is more of like a graphics layout piece of software than a strictly GIS. So it's basically a graphics piece of graphics software like Adobe Illustrator or uh, Photoshop or something like that where the content is being pulled from your map display in the background over there. So obviously the first thing we probably want to add is a new map and we get this tool and it gives us a crosshair and we basically just draw a box and it's going to fill that box with our map in the background. So you can uh, change the size more specifically later, but just do it by eye at first. And you can see essentially what we're doing is getting exactly what we were looking at before. We're getting that uh, filling up at a specific map scale, which is displayed over here. And we may be happy with the zoom because we zoomed in enough over here. We may not be. Um, but what you can do over here is to set a very specific map scale. So right now it's like 1 to 3,000. 16.622, which is not a particularly even map scale, so maybe we want to go 1 to 3,000. So we can literally just type 3,000 in there, hit enter, and it will zoom at the scale of 1 to 3,000. So a nice even map scale. And maybe that's exactly what we want. Uh, you know, we may want to play with this a little bit. Maybe we do want to be like 3,500. You can just do that. Maybe that's too zoomed out. Maybe we want 2,500. And we can zoom in on that, and maybe that's happy with us. I kind of don't like the 1 to 3,000 scale from what I had going on. So I'm going to put it back to that. If we wanted to, we could even rotate the map. And you can use these arrow keys to do it, or you can type it directly in there. And again, it's up to you to decide whether rotating is important or not. In our case, I don't think we want to do that. You can even change the projection of the map on the fly. But we're just going to leave everything the same. Uh, uh, for the time being uh, for this particular project. We don't want to get too deep into some of these things, right? Okay, so now that we have this added, we want to make sure it's the whole window here is aligned to the way we want. And so after you add the map item, it kind of automatically selects this uh, tool that's select or move item. And we get this little hand when we're over an item. And if we click our mouse, left mouse key, we can drag and move this around on the page. And if we're slow, we can see these little blue lines pop out when we're perfectly centered, either on the horizontal and vertical axis. So this is an easy way to easily center our object. And if we wanted to, we could also use these align tools. So I can select my object, go up here, and put a line uh, to the bottom or something like that. If I had more than one object, I would probably have to uh, align it to the page. But uh, I can do that uh, when I get more than one item here as well. So that's another way to do it. But when you have just one item, it's pretty simple to see the sort of snap lines, the blue little lines that pop up to tell you you're centered. OK, so first thing is uh, done, that we have our map there. and We've set a scale. Next thing is to figure out what map elements we, we think are essential. Do we need a scale bar? Do we need a north arrow? Do we need a legend? Um, and it's up to you again to decide that. Uh, probably in this case a scale bar will be useful. So I grab the scale bar tool and I throw it down here and it sticks it uh, there at the bottom. And let's say I want the scale bar to align perfectly 
with the side of this thing. If I hold the shift key down and I click the map behind it, I've now selected both of them. And now when I go over here and I hit align right, it actually moves the scale bar over to the end. And I can go down here and put uh, align bottom and it moves it, boom, right down there in the bottom right corner. Um, and if I click outside, it's deselected everything. I can go back here and I can drag it over manually if I wanted to. But I liked the way that it was, so I'm going to align it to the bottom right corner. That's great. Uh, and then let's say I wanted to add a north arrow, and you'll notice, hey, there's no north arrow. So what you have to do is instead add a picture. So that's adding a picture. And then um, if you know if you have a, a, a specific north arrow image file, you can navigate to it in the folder tree like this. But simply, if you go to this where it says search directories, it has a whole bunch of canned images, the same ones you looked at before, and you can find a nice north arrow that you like. And you can stick it here, and you can scale it like just by dragging the corner like so. And again, you can manually put it there, and you can actually see the little blue bars stick up. Or you can choose align, uh, so you have to select both of them. You can align left and align top and get it into the upper left corner as well. Okay, so here's a basic map. Uh, the scale is there, the north arrow is there. We'll get a legend on it here in a second. But well, let's think about how we want to edit some of these things. So let's just see uh, a couple of things. So what we'll notice is that over here we have a couple of tabs. Layout is the whole layout for the whole page. Um, item properties are depending on which item you have selected. And you'll notice as I select other things uh, on this page, they get bold over here. And so then if I go over here and highlight this, you'll see that I get some properties. Uh, so depending on what kind of item, scale bar, image, map, whatever, I'll have different properties that I can, um, that I can, that I can manipulate. And here, let's say I even had an inset map or something like that, I could choose which map I wanted to link my scale, this particular scale bar to. So I can totally do that and I can move that around. I can also change this, I can change it to scale for map one. And now I'll know that this is the scale bar mapped or linked to map one, right? Okay. And I can change a whole bunch of stuff. If I don't want it to be in meters, I can make it be kilometers, and all of a sudden that's changed. Or I can even change it to miles, should I want it to not be in metric. Uh, and then uh, I can change a few things here, like the actual label that's displayed. Maybe I want to write out meters completely, and we will actually see meters showing up down here in the scale bar thing. Uh, as opposed to just M, right? So that's again up to you to decide how you want to do it. By default, it just sort of picks uh, two segments to the right of zero and no segments to the left of zero. Let's say I wanted to have 100 or 200 negative meters on the left side. I can put two uh, additional clicks over here and you can see I've got that uh, popping up over here on the left side as well. And I can make those go away and I only have right side. And I can make that go down to just one, or I can make that go to like four. And now I have 400 meters on the right side. And uh, I can change the number of units. Let's say I only wanted one, but I wanted the one to be 400. I can do that. And now I have a single bar that's <coughs> excuse me, just 400 meters long. And for me, that's a little overkill uh, for this particular map. So maybe I want this to be 200 units. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. And just to be black, and that's the way I want it to look right there. So that's pretty cool. I can also go in and change uh, like the margin around it. <coughs> I can change the font of the text. I can choose from a whole bunch of fonts. If I don't like the one that's chosen by default, <coughs> I can change the size of the font to make it bigger and I can make it the font be, uh, you know, I can make font be white if I wanted to. And again, this is what you need to do uh, on your own. You have to decide if that's what you want as well. And I click that to sort of go back, uh, get back to where I was. Uh, I can have a frame around it. I can have a background of any color I want. Not that I want to do that necessarily, but I could. 
So play around with all of these things. I can change the position and size manually. I have like super control over all, everything that I want. Now, what I don't want to do is to make this ugly and distracting like I've done right now. <coughs> so I want to, <coughs> I would want to choose essentially um, what, you know, I'd want to choose better choices than, I've, than I have particularly done here. Uh, I can turn the background off at least it'll look a little bit better. All right, and I can do that for all the elements that I want. What I want to say next is uh, this is dynamically linked. Uh, the, what's displayed here is dynamically displayed what's over here. So if I go back to map one and <clears throat> I go back over here and I, z I change something, like I, for example, um, take the orthos off and I just have this. If I go back to my uh, layout, it hasn't updated yet. But I can hit update a preview and whatever I did over in the map display is going to now be shown in my layout view as well. So that's kind of a neat and important thing to do. So what you'll have to do is to go back here, change any styles you want. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to change this to be uh, for, for everything to be uh, thicker, like these roads to be to be a little bit thicker. Um, I go in here and I do that and uh, change this one to be a little thicker as well. And I hit apply. And you see that's updated over here, but it hasn't yet updated here until I hit update preview and then it does. Okay? So that's really important to know that uh, whatever you've done over here is going to sort of not automatically just be displayed over here. You have to hit update preview over here. Um, also, if you want to change the zoom level uh, to match whatever it is you're looking over here, you can do your zoom to your happy over here, come back over here and hit set map canvas extent. Uh, and you will actually zoom in. And you'll notice actually that the scale has changed. So that's exactly doing the same thing, but, but setting it to match. And if you change the scale over here, so let's say I manually change this to 2000 and click enter. And I want to make my map display match that scale. I click this other one where it says view extent in map canvas. And now I'm zoomed in to the same scale which is uh, which is what I had set over here, like so, right? Boom. So that's how you can kind of work back and forth between the map display and your layout manager as well. Now, for the map itself, there's a few things you might want to overlay. You can add a grid, um, and, and in this case, it would be uh, any size that you wanted and you can change it to be uh, in map units and you can change the interval to be every one degree or something like that. In our case that's not going to do anything because we're much more zoomed in than that. So we'd have to put it to be like 0 0.001 or something like that. And then you would start to see it, right? Uh, and this is an arbitrary grid that is just on your layout manager. It's not in your map display at all. Right? And you can do the same thing over here with your uh, vertical unit as well. And then you can get a new grid over here. And this could be helpful if you really want to locate yourself. If you're going to use this for a field map, maybe you want a grid. And maybe you don't want a grid as well. You can change this you know, to display in different ways. Uh, and you can also change the line style to be dashed and dotted in any way that you actually want. Uh, so you can have a grid uh, and you can remove the grid that way as well. Uh, same thing, you can add a, a, f a solid frame around there. That might be a nice thing to have. Uh, <clears throat> you can have the background or no, no background. You can set the color. If the background is transparent, that might be something you, know, you, you don't want to do. Uh, so you just leave it with no background. And uh, there are a variety of things that you can actually do to um, sort of add to this as, uh, you know, add or subtract elements as well. Um, what else do I want to talk to you about here? Oh, you can add an overview as well. And an overview 
is essentially a um, like a zoom in or a zoom out locator map uh, as well. And what you want to do is uh, you'd have to make this be a, a different map frame. And for project one, I don't want you to mess around with overview maps, so I'm purposely not going to show you the details of this because it adds just like a little bit more complexity. I'm just introducing you to the fact that if you wanted to, you can, and if you ever need to, I can show you how or pass you on a, a separate tutorial for how to do that. And what I would say is just to fall, fool around with uh, a few of these things, and uh, you know whether you want to have a grid or not, uh, decide what you want to do. Uh, um, you know from a graphical perspective. Uh, you may want one, you may not want to have one. Uh, you may want a frame, you may not want to have a frame. Um, if you want to have a graticule around there, you do that through the grid and you do it through the actual zebra frame. And then, of course, you change your units over here to be the ones, oops, 0.001. Enter. What did I do wrong here? Anyway, you'd set your uh, it to be a zebra frame, and it would align to the grid, which for some reason there. Okay, because I was not hitting the right keys on my keyboard. <laughs> zero zero one. Enter. There we go. Okay. So here we have a grid and we have the zebra frame and maybe we don't want the grid. We would uh, essentially just change the line style to be totally transparent and then we would have a zebra frame without a grid. And uh, we'll go back over here and we can actually, if you fool around with this, you can actually get the coordinates to draw and you'll have to change your spacing perhaps to have them show and you can also, if you fool around with this, change the font, change the orientation of the font <coughs> so that you can have it be um, vertical like that on different sides of the, uh, of the frame. So the right and the left, you might want to have those things be vertical, descending and ascending. So you can really fool around with this. And again, what you have to be careful of is not adding too many things uh, so that you're all of a sudden distracting. Only add enough to what's necessary. I guess the final thing I should show you are a couple of tips about the legend. So by default when you add it, it's huge because literally every data layer that you have here is going to be uh, shoved into the legend. So we even have our SRTM. Now you can go in here and you can remove these things by right clicking them and hit remove layer but let's just say you want to hide them from the legend you can actually do that pretty simply by going down um, in the legend properties uh, item properties legend uh, uh, legend items and then right clicking on them or unclicking auto update clicking on the one that you want to remove and hitting the minus thing and then it goes away same thing with this and then you can basically just whittle it down to just the ones that you want. And you can go into any little thing that you want and update it. So if I want to change the name of this, I can just put structures, right? And click OK, and then that's updated over here. And then here I can change this to be old structures. I mean, I literally can put anything I want. And I can even remove individual ones. Let's say I don't have anything that uh, that's this green, I can remove that from here just to make it less cluttered, right? And survey grid, I can remove that as well. Uh, and then you can even add items, you can format that. There's a bunch of different tools here that you can explore. You can change the font, you can change the number of columns. So I want these side by side, two columns. I can make the column width change. I can split layers across the columns or not. Uh, I can change uh, the size of the symbols in here if I wanted to. I can change the spacing all around it from the top to the bottom uh, by changing some of these things. So again, fool around with some of these things and see exactly what they do. Maybe you want them to be wider, maybe you don't, right? 
Uh, I can get real specific with the position and size. I can have a frame drawn around it. I can have it have a background of a different color than white if I wanted to. I can do all the things that I showed you before I can pretty much do with this. Um, the other thing that I can do is to give it a title uh, of like legend if I wanted to, or I can put the map title here if I wanted to, if I think that that's important. Um, so I would again play around with a bunch of these things and see exactly what they do. And again, get these things styled to the way that you want them. Now importantly, before we go here, I want to show you a couple of additional neat things. Uh, Here's how you save, and this is just saving your layout, not messing with your map. It is part of the QGIS project, so eventually you'll want to save the project as well. Uh, you have a couple of uh, uh, zoom tools that lets you zoom. You can use your mouse wheel to zoom in and out just on your uh, layout. You can use the pan tool to pan as well. Uh, you can click these things to zoom one to one or zoom to your last zoom over here. And one interesting thing is when you're trying to get the um, actual data in your map centered the way you want, this little guy here called Move Item Content is neat. And what it's doing is panning the data inside your map display or map frame in here. So it's not going to move the items around on the screen, but it's literally just going to move the, the focus of what you're actually looking on, looking at, you know, from your actual data around. So this is helpful to help you get things. Uh, oriented. And in here when you have that selected you can actually use uh, the same other tools for example you can change your map scale at the same time and then you can be okay now I want to move this over. So these things are interactive as well. So they let you really get cropped into exactly what you what part of your data you want to show. And when you're done Hit save, and you can export to a variety of formats. Here we have a couple just sort of canned ones. A PDF is super useful just to send it as a, as a document. Uh, SVG is a vector graphics. You can take that into something like uh, Adobe Illustrator, and you can get real into the, the lines and change, you know, add things that way. Or if you just want this to go to a graphics file, like a, a TIFF or a PNG or a JPEG file, uh, you can do that here as well. And by default, it takes the name of your layout, but you can tap, tap, tap whatever name you want, and hit save on that. And here you can change the export resolution. 300 dpi is useful, is pretty good for just normal printing. If you were going to make a big uh, blow up map, you might want to change that to be like 600 dpi and just click save. And now we've exported this guy. And if I go into my, um, sorry, into my upper, uh, into my Documents folder, and uh, where did I put? Oh, yeah, home, uh, QJS projects folder, SPV survey, and here's my output JPEG. This is the, the image that I made of my map. Now, I don't think this is a wonderful map because I wasn't really having a lot of intent behind this, but you can see how you can actually now make a bunch of different outputs and save them. And this is how you're going to output your final thematic maps for project one and insert them into your write-up. So I think that's probably much more than enough for you at this moment. Uh, so I'm going to stop the practicum uh, with that and again I'll be here in class to answer questions.